Good morning. You've come to this event often enough to know how it starts. Good morning. And one more time. Good morning. That's enough panto, but we do need to do it. Get ourselves going. This is an interactive conference. Talking right at the start is just part of it. My name is Donald Taylor. I'm the chairman of the Learning Technologies Conference. It's my job to welcome you to the event and to say thank you for coming. I always say nothing's more important than time. You've invested two days. It's our job to serve you and make those two days as valuable as possible. A good use of your time. Having put the program together, I'm confident that's the case. Looking forward to meeting you, talking, and finding out what your challenges are over the next couple of days, and hopefully getting us all on the way to solving them. My job is to get the housekeeping out of the way, to ask a question, get us all thinking about the key topics, and then get off the stage and make room for our keynote speaker, Tamandra Harkness. I am going to start with the most important part of the housekeeping, which is, of course, the Wi-Fi stuff, right? So. Hashtag LT20UK, self-explanatory. The Wi-Fi is that network, LT Conference, and the password is LTConf20. Kind of makes sense, but that's going to disappear in a second, and so please get yourselves online now. And the reason why it's important to get online is that I'm going to be watching Twitter during the course of Tamandra's keynote, and I'm going to be, at the end of it, feeding your questions into her. So it's a great mechanism for getting your thoughts and your observations to me on stage. All right, quick bit of housekeeping then. If you were here last year, you know how this works. We have a big room, it divides into four immediately after the keynote, and the rooms are one, two, three, and, sorry, one, two, three, and four. There is also a fifth room, one level down, so those are where the tracks are. Um, the exhibition, of course, is on the ground floor. Don't forget that there are great seminars taking place in the exhibition as well, and of course that's where lunch is. Now, if you go down to the exhibition and you're wondering where the heck lunch is in that enormous space, there's a, gray, a gray inlaid bit of carpet. If you follow that, like the yellow brick road, it will take you to the destination of your lunch. Um, during lunchtime, okay, you visit the exhibition if, if you want to, but we also have a couple of sessions taking place up here as well and that's in tracks four and five, so be aware that there's stuff taking place here as well. Maybe grab a quick lunch and then join the session up here if you want to. Um, at the end of the day, we've got drinks outside, so on the reception area here in the next level down. There are also drinks later on at the Fox Pub, which is the pub outside the main area, and there are other things, of course, going on as well. Now, there's lots of other stuff going on uh, during the course of the day, but one thing that there are a couple of things I want to really bring your attention to. Uh, one is we've got the launch of Emerald Works research, and that's taking place at the end of the day today in track two. So be aware that's happening. And you can, so you can get your drinks, you can come in and listen to the launch of research. Uh, other things, I've got a list of, I, I think, four things here, some of which are new, some of which are not. Uh, firstly, books. Kogan Page have a stand. Uh, we have a sort of a loose relationship with Kogan Page. Everyone seems to write for them. They've got a book stand uh, on the first level, and Miriam Nealon is doing a signing of her book, uh, Evidence Informed Learning Design, at five o'clock today. So you can get a beer and go and get Miriam to sign your, well, you have to buy it as well. You buy the book and she signs it for you. And of course, not just Miriam, they've got all the other people who've written for Kogan Page, Nigel, sorry, I was gonna start a whole list, so I can't remember anybody else, but Nigel Payne, who else do we need apart from Nigel? Okay, and, and lots of other people as well. And so, so to find the answer to that, go and have a look at the book stand, and it's covered with books. Um, new this year, new this year, 30 under 30. We've got 30 people that we've um, given a, a vastly reduced uh, uh, entrance fee for the conference. We're doing lots of stuff around it, and there will be other things added to that. Uh, they will be introduced to you tomorrow, um, but if you see somebody uh, who looks like they might be under 30, actually it doesn't matter if they're in the group or not, but please feel free to have a conversation. I spent an hour with them yesterday telling them that the most important thing is to tackle you and have conversations with you to increase their knowledge. So please don't let me down. Have a conversation with them, okay? Um, Learn Appeal. Every year we have backed Learn Appeal with the redoubtable Leslie Price. Leslie, where are you? Leslie Price. She's downstairs. She's already working hard on the stand downstairs. Learn Appeal's job is to bring e-learning to people that don't have the internet and sometimes even electricity. So they're working in Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, and elsewhere in the world, but also in the UK with charities. 
So perhaps people need safeguarding and they need to get offline. Fine, they can get e-learning without being on the internet. And Learn Appeal makes that happen. They're now working with Dopsy, a diabetes charity. If you go down to Learn Appeal, they're on sand F70, you can find out more about what's happening there and hopefully support them. They live off the support they get from our field. Please help them. I think that's everything. Apart from, <laughs> can we put my slides back up, please? Okay. Could you move on to the next slide or the previous one? There we go. Okay, so Women in Learning is something that we've also supported for a while. It started in the States with Elliot Maisie and uh, Sharon Clappy Kaliubi running panels there, which got people together to talk about the particular issues faced by women in the field of learning and development. And last year we did a session here, and it's fair to say that after having been supporting it for a while, last year it really kicked off. We have a networking session taking place, well, you can see the times there. So in theater, theater three, it's, um, it, it is today, and we've got a networking session taking place, and then tomorrow, uh, a workshop taking place in room five. It is not just for women, it is for anybody who wants to make sure that our field is balanced in how, in the people it employs, and in how it does its work. Is that fair enough, Kate? Thank you very much. Right. Okay, that was a kind of tepid round of applause. I, I'm going to sort of say a sentence, end it, and then I'd love a whoop and a round of applause. Um, so we're hoping that with Women in Learning, we're going to try to make the world a slightly balanced, a more balanced place in our corner of it. <laughs> Honestly, I'm so inept. What would I do without you? You're fantastic. I have a question, a question we're going to ask each other, get some pre key feedback, and then I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. The question is, and I'd like you to turn to the person next to you to discuss it, if you have a choice, someone you know, someone you don't know, choose someone you don't know. The question is very straightforward. What's your challenge for this year, for 2020? What's the key professional challenge? Obviously, if you want to share your personal issues, that's fine too. But let's stick to the professional challenges. Turn to your neighbor, talk for one minute, and I'll get feedback. Go. Where's the camera? All right. See, that's the trouble with learning and development people. We start the conversation train going and it just doesn't stop. Right. I said, I said I'll use my natural charisma to get everyone to talk, to stop talking, and it just, it's plainly not working. Right, what feedback have we got? What great challenges do we have for this year? Yeah, you're not so talkative now, are you, eh? All right, come on, okay. Yes, in the front row here, madam. Okay, small challenge here, transforming the world of technology training. Okay, and you're gonna get all that done by September, take the rest of the year off. Fantastic, okay. Uh, anything specific? Uh, like situation cyber security. Cyber security, all right. Actually, to be fair, cyber security is a really big issue for a lot of people, and, uh, and, and you know, it's only when it goes wrong that you realize just how important it is. Yes, okay, so transforming tech and cyber. Yes, go ahead, shout it out. Um, I want to use the learning platform to create a conversation Brilliant, okay. Uh, any, particular any particular reason for that? Um, yes, I have a problem with loading screens for the user. Right. Fantastic, good, good for you. If we can support you in any way, let us know. All right, any other challenges people have got? By the way, let's all, you know, obviously they're all challenges, but I like the fact that we've got positive views of it. We're going to tackle it, and that's, that's fantastic. Anything else? This, yes, over there. Aligning dispersed teams. Aligning dispersed teams, geographically dispersed teams, getting, getting them to work together effectively. Yes, that's a really, I, I'm having increasing conversations with people for whom that's a real issue, just getting people to work together. The back of the room, by the way, they're great. They've got loads of great ideas. <laughs> Uh, anybody at the front? Yes. Okay, okay, here, come on. I'm Valencia from Ireland, and I want to promote my training business in England. Shameless. <laughs> but give her a round of applause for sheer chutzpah. All right. 
and over there we had one. Yeah. Oh, winning hearts and minds. Is that you personally or is that a professional one? All right, okay. But actually, winning hearts and minds and getting people involved in what we're doing and bought into it. Yeah, that's a, we won't do the diversity. We won't, we won't sell the, in the business. We won't do the cybersecurity unless we do get people engaged and bought into it, absolutely. And look, of course, everyone in the room has got their own challenges, and we are here to support you in that. So please, if you've got something that you are challenged with, have the conversation. These two days are, yes, about a great, a great conference program, but it's also about the people in the room and the networking. So please use the people to help you solve your challenges, and of course the speakers and me as well. So Donald H. Taylor, look at me on Google. I don't know the answer, but I do know lots of people. So hit me up, and maybe I can put you in touch with the right person. Speaking of putting you in touch with the right person, it's time for me to introduce our keynote speaker today, Demandra Harkness, who is a broadcaster and author, author of the book, Big Data Does Size Matter? She said, you could insert your own punchline after that, Don. Uh, I think the answer is yes, it does, but uh, it depends what you do with it. Uh, she's on BBC's Radio 4, where she does uh, the Future Proofing program and also uh, podcasts around that. Her latest work is about moving from the 20th century, the century of mass communication and mass everything, to the 21st century, where personalization is a key theme. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Tamandra Harkness. Tamandra. Thank you, Don. Hi. <laughs> Rest, I, lo I love the way that you weren't sure whether you were meant to titter at the book title or not. Like, oh, is this, uh, does she know she's made a double entendre there? Uh, yes, I did. That was the whole point of calling it Does Size Matter, was to say exactly it is what you do with it that counts. Uh, so feel free to titter at any double entendres even accidental ones. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I am thinking at the moment, this is, this is my, my kind of current thinking. So if you have any ideas or you think I'm wrong about any of this, I would really welcome hearing them. Uh, and then I will steal your thoughts and put them into my next book, absolutely shamelessly. Uh, this started really because I spent a lot of time thinking about trends in society and looking at the future, especially, and look, talking to people who are at the cutting edge, not only of technological developments, but also its uh, social developments and how things are used. And I just felt that a number of trends were emerging that were all kind of moving in a similar direction. So to give you a couple of examples, uh, medicine. And th now this is actually a slide from the NHS. So this is stuff that's happening now. They're looking at personalizing medicine. So they don't just say, you've got these symptoms, we'll give you the same drug that everyone these symptoms gets. They try and narrow it down. This is partly what mapping the human genome is all about, to be able to really narrow down drugs which are much more likely to work for you, not for the whole population, but for you and people very like you. But the flip side of that is also that they're looking much more at preventative medicine and personalizing that by gathering data about you, not just your medical records, but data perhaps from wearables, so that eventually, they will be able to fend off you having a heart attack long before you have one by tracking the patterns of your heart rhythms and saying, actually, this is a bit unusual. We're going to send you a text message. Can you come in and talk to the doctor? Maybe we want you to change your lifestyle because that is putting you at more risk of, of things. And I have to admit, I started to get to the point. I mean, who here has a, a wearable like a Fitbit or something they use anyway? Loads of you. Okay, right. And so who here has a thing where it incentivizes you to do things like take more exercise or drink more water? Yeah, quite a few of you. Is it financial? Do you get like free cinema tickets and things? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I was hearing about this and going, okay, well, this is, you know, this is fine. This is exerting basic human uh, psychology, nudge theory, if you like. But are we going to get to the point where it actually works stick as well as carrot and you, your wearable actually gives you an electric shock to get you out of bed to go jogging? And as I was joking about this, I discovered that it's already available. <laughs> so if any of you feel that the carrot is not working and you want a bit of stick to get you to live more healthily, I can recommend the Pavlok to you, named after Pavlov, of course, who conditioned his dogs to uh, be ready for food. Uh, so this is, a, th this is the kind of the dark side of personalization, if you like. Let's look at them a bit, a bit lighter. Uh, if you look at... Uh, sorry, I think I've missed one there. Have I missed one? No. 
uh, personalization. Uh, so this is um, it, something that, now I don't know if any of you have gone this far. Uh, anyone in HR here, you might be interested in this. This is actually inserting an RFID chip uh, in your employees, which a couple of countries, a couple of companies are trying on a voluntary basis. Uh, so this is how big it is. It's absolutely tiny. It's the size of a match head, and it's a little RFID tag, similar to what you might have in your travel card or, or a hotel key room card. And, and so you could use it for all those things. You could tag your employees so that you, they come into work and go like that, and the door recognizes them and opens, and the lift goes up to their floor. Or, you know, if you've got a company wellness program and they, they've not been taking as much exercise, the lift stops the floor below theirs and makes them walk up the last flight. See, it's the, the, the possibilities are, are limitless. And if, you're, if any of you are sitting there, well, I hope you are thinking, I don't know, this sounds a bit intrusive, actually physically chipping your employees, then ask yourself, okay, but does your company use biometrics, things like uh, fingerprints or facial recognition? Because this is the way we are heading to identify people. Uh, and arguably, this has more privacy issues because if you put a chip in, you can take a chip out. But once someone's captured your face or your iris or your fingerprint, those qualities stick with you for life. So they, they do have your biometric data for life. Yeah, just to start on a nice big brother note. Uh, so, so to lighten things up a bit, think, let's think about fashion. Am I pointing this the wrong way? I probably am. Uh, and this was a, a great thing we discovered where, and, and again, the prototypes are already out there. Instead of having to go into a shop full of clothes that don't suit you and don't fit you, you could just look in an electronic mirror, and the mirror will measure up your measurements just by looking at it. You won't, you won't have to come dressed in graph paper. Uh, as I did today, you just wear normal clothes. <laughs> I have, I've come, I, any mathematicians in the room, I've come dressed as non-Euclidean space. <laughs> That's great, three mathematicians in the room, you're my people. Uh, but it will, it will measure up your measurements, and then it will give you a virtual picture of yourself wearing clothes that are available to buy. This is what you would look like wearing these clothes. This is what's happening in the picture. She's looking in the virtual mirror. And if you like it, you can order it just by touching the mirror and it will be I know, delivered by drone or 3D printed in your, in your cupboard. Uh, and in case, again, in case you think this is a long way out, there is already a company. And some of you who hate shopping as much as I do may have already signed up to this that will basically ask you a lot of questions about yourself, ask you some photos, ask your measurements, and then recommend clothes for you, and even send you a parcel of clothes to your house, and you try them on and keep the ones you want to and send back the other ones. Imagine a shop that only sells clothes suited to you. Uh, and so this is, this is already available. So this, this personalization is already here. It, this, is, this is not the future. This is already where we're at. And I was really struck by that advert that appeared in my Twitter feed because this phrase, imagine a shop that only sells clothes suited to you, well, now you don't have to, sums up for me that change from going into a clothes shop, having to rake through all the stuff that you don't want to find the stuff you do want. No, the promise is that in the future, only the stuff that you do want will be sent directly to you. Okay, so this is the personalized century. What, I'm contrasting this, really, to the century before. This is, this is the change that I think has happened since maybe our grandparents' age, uh, possibly even our parents' age, and some of us, which was the mass century. Uh, and again, give you a few examples. Mass production, obviously. So around the start of the 20th century, it became possible to mass produce things that were identical by doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, for the people working there, obviously, it was to some extent dehumanizing because they just became a cog in the process. But there were advantages because suddenly we could produce things very cheaply, so it was possible to be the person that worked in a factory and also be able to afford to buy the things that the factory made. So all of our material uh, well-being and wealth really went up. Uh, then, of course, there was mass health, so health provision became something generally governments got interested in. Certainly things like mass vaccination, hospitals, raised the general standard of health of the population. Life expectancy doubled in about three generations. So really extraordinary progress. Mass media, because we tended to get our news and even our entertainment from just a few, originally a few newspapers, then some radio channels, then a few television channels, but all very top-down 
and edited by just a few people. So just a few people decided what was news, what was interesting, what was entertaining, what we should get. And once you'd picked your newspaper, you got the same news in the same order as all the other readers. Uh, and even on television, you, you watched the same thing as most other people, which, of course, was not always a bad thing. It meant that we had great shared moments. So half a billion people shared the moment when the first men landed on the moon, either watching television or listening around the world. And the Times at the time commented that this was the first time that so many people had shared such a huge historical event while it was happening, uh, and that people would remember. They had a lovely phrase about little children who were taken down out of bed to witness this would still remember it when they were grandparents. I don't know, I mean, maybe there's a couple of people in the room for, for whom that's true. Uh, and then, of course, politics, because it was only in the 20th century that most of us got the vote. Uh, not, not only women, but also in the UK, certainly working class men didn't get the vote until roughly 100 years ago. So suddenly, politics became something that everybody actually had a say in and everybody had some power. But also, it wasn't just, again, it wasn't just about governments, there were mass movements things like the Civil Rights Movement, Women's Liberation Movement, uh, that actually said, no, we, we, we want to be treated equally. We don't want to be treated differently. We're, we're here and we, we want the same treatment as everybody else. So contrast that with today, which is the personalised century, because we can look at all those things. The mini plant in Oxford still has a production line and still produces hundreds of minis every day, but everyone is different, because each customer can specify what they want their car to be like. And this is not just a matter of convenience. It's not just a matter of you saying, well, this is the engine size I need, and this is the, the layout of the car that I need for my practical purposes. It's also because the things we buy, we want them to reflect who we think we are. We want them to say something about ourselves. You know, if you buy a Prius, this is probably a bit old-fashioned now, but you're not just going, this is the most practical car for me. You're saying... I, I want to make a statement about the kind of person I am. I'm the kind of person that cares about the planet. So even when we have mass production, we still often consume it in a much more personalised way. Personalised health, we've already talked about, but this is a, this is a wearable that, for example, we did, talked about with diabetes earlier. I, I know a lot of diabetics now that have a little sensor built into their arm uh, that can feed straight to their mobile phone what their current blood sugar status is. Uh, and so they can medicate in a much more direct way. Uh, media, that has completely transformed. Everybody now has their own individual news and entertainment channel. Every one of us gets a completely different intake of news and entertainment, uh, curated partly by us, partly by the algorithms, partly by who we know, who we're in touch with, who you follow on Twitter is a big one for me. It's where I get my my initial news. So every single person is consuming a different stream of information and entertainment uh, that's different from absolutely everybody else's. And politics. And I think this is, this is quite interesting because it's not that we don't have a mass politics and masses of people voting and governments and so on. And, and some of the issues are still mass issues. Uh, and we still do have mass movements. But not only do they happen differently, because more and more campaigning happens through social media, so it's coming through these individual channels, but also the kind of issues that we're concerned with are subtly shifting. I, I think it's very interesting that the T-shirt the guy's wearing in the background here kind of covers, covers that range of concerns, because it's equality, so people still want to be treated equally. They don't want worse treatment than anybody else. It's diversity, as somebody raised earlier on, that the recognition that people are different and you don't you want to be treated equally but not necessarily the same and it's identity because you want to be recognized as an individual so how do we get here okay i well i recognized i i've uh, there's three strands basically three broad strands that have driven us to this point that, that drive this change and the most obvious one is technology of course because without the technology we couldn't have this very personalised offer to each of us in all these fields. Uh, so to come back to this Twitter advert that, you know, the, the, the clothes that are only suited to you, this was actually targeted to me. 
Uh, and this, this perhaps actually should, it, if you're thinking, oh no, it's true, big data knows me better than I know myself, uh, this, this, this might comfort you because uh, Twitter targeted me with this advert specifically uh, and also with this advert. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to say this was quite interesting for me because I realized I don't remotely mind that Twitter thinks I'm a man. But when it started thinking that I had gray hair, <laughs> I, I found that a bit harder to deal with, which is, is maybe revealing about me. Uh, and, uh, but this one, it got really badly wrong. This one did upset me. I mean, you know, no disrespect to West Bromwich Albion, but I spend quite a lot of time tweeting about Liverpool <laughs> Football Club. So, so Twitter got this one really badly wrong. And this one, I'm kind of partly worried and partly really intrigued. Twitter is obsessed with selling me a vacuum furnace. <laughs> I know, if anyone here knows what a vacuum furnace is, Please do tell me later. Uh, so this, I, I mean, if, uh, to be honest, if they keep sending me this advert, I'm going to buy one out of curiosity. I, I have no idea, what, just to find out what, what it is and what it does. But I do worry slightly about the woman in the picture who's clearly not wearing protective clothing <laughs> suitable for being inside a vacuum furnace. I think the health and safety executive need to have a word. Uh, but, but technology is, is the means by which we can be targeted. Obviously, Twitter adverts is a kind of frivolous example, and I'm certainly, I'm not somebody that gets worried about being targeted by adverts. I think if you reach adulthood without knowing how to resist adverts, then you don't stand a chance in this world, basically. Uh, but the, there, are, there are other things that can have more impact on your life. Uh, so I looked at Twitter to see, like, what, what, Twitter's very good. You can just go in, and it will tell you what it thinks it knows about you. And obviously, I haven't told it any of this stuff, because it doesn't ask. So it's inferred that I am male, which I'm not. Uh, I, I just thought I would say this, because I've just, I've just come back from traveling, and a lot of the customs people uh, seem to call me sir. <laughs> I know, uh, who knows. Uh, I am between 18 and 54, so I got that right anyway. <laughs> Although it's quite a, quite a big margin of error. And then the way it gets this information is it infers it from what it does know. And what it does know is my activity, who I follow, who follows me, what I tweet, uh, what, I, what I like. Uh, and from this, it gets my interests. And this is what I thought was really interesting because I looked at the list of what it thought my interests were and it was almost bang on. It thought I like horror, which I don't. Everything else I like, yeah, yeah, actually, you, you've got me right. I like politics, I like comedy, I like technology, I like motorcycles, I like maths, all those things. You're, you're dead right. And just ask yourself, if, you, if this was the only information you had about somebody and you were asked to make a wild guess, you would probably also think this person was male. It's a stereotype, and you know, we, we would all sit here and go, you shouldn't assume that somebody who likes all this stuff is male. But the way the algorithms work is purely statistical. So if you said, is it more probable, mathematically, that a person with these interests is male? Yes, it is more probable, because more of the people that like all these things will be male. And that's all the algorithm has done. It's gone, well, on the basis of probability, you're male and eight, between 18 and 54. Uh, and, and that's how all the profiling works. It's probabilistic. It doesn't know for sure unless I tell it. Uh, and little confession here, after many years of Twitter thinking I was male and feeding me hilarious slides, it suddenly wised up that I wasn't. And the adverts I saw got really boring. <laughs> and so I went in and switched it back. <laughs> so I have lied to Twitter, basically. Uh, I've told it I'm a man. But you can self-identify, right? So it's fine. Uh, but most of the stuff that is known about us, most of the profiling that enables personalization is inferring information. It's not information we give it directly. It knows one thing, and it's inferring something else. So what it's doing is, although it feels personal, what it's actually doing is plotting us in relation to other people. It's saying, of all the people that we have data for, all the millions of people we have data for, most of the ones who like motorbikes and mathematics and engineering and whatever, are male. And therefore, on the balance of probability, not anything else, we're going to put you in, in that camp. So we are plotted on a many, many dimensional graph. I've reduced this one to, this is only three, because I think 
a, a million dimensional graph is a bit much this early in the morning. Uh, but, but this is all, all we're doing. We're being plotted. But we're being plotted across many, many, many dimensions because of all the data that we put out, which I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot about in the past. And so in a way, although it feels like a complete change from the century of mass provision where we all got the same, it's actually just a continuation of the same technology. So this is, this is UNIVAC from the 1950s, one of those computers of which the actual working part would have been nearly the size of this room and, and would have held a very small memory and worked very slowly. But machines like this that used to do, for example, the American census, Hollerith, who invented the first machine to tabulate the American census results, went on to found IBM, the, the company that became IBM. So there is a direct line from the very large primitive machines developed to make the mass century work, to keep track of populations and things and people, uh, is, is the same technology. It's just much better, much faster, and much more portable. So the technology is, is one of them, but there's also, I think, less tangible factors. One of them is choice. We simply have much more choice about almost everything than we used to. Now, the, the, this picture I took, uh, <laughs> and so this is just awful now. It just feels like a kind of bragging picture. I took on a previous visit to California. You can go out on a 125-year-old sailing boat, uh, which I highly recommend if you're ever there. It's called the Alma, and you can go out sailing on San Francisco Bay. So we're outside the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm looking in thinking, this must have been what it was like for people arriving, moving to America, especially a lot of Chinese people uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries moved to America looking for a better life, looking for opportunity. Uh, and they would have seen this view approaching the city and come with probably all their family's hopes, probably the whole family saved up to get them the fare. And when they got there, they faced a really hard time because they were relatively very poor. There was a lot of discrimination against them, both uh, in terms of individual prejudice, but also legal discrimination. They were very much treated as second-class citizens. They had a really hard time, and, the, the peop and a lot of them worked the railroads. The people that did make it took them several generations to get the better life they'd hoped for for their family. Uh, but, you know, they did it. They were very tenacious, a lot of them. Whereas I... Basically, I'm self-employed, and I was able to afford to pay my own fare to go out to California and do some work and have some meetings and then go out for a, a sail on the bay just for fun. And the contrast there between the opportunities that are open to me and the choices that are open to me, I found really striking. And this isn't, I mean, this is partly material. This is partly simply because of the mass production. We simply have much more of everything. We have much more disposable income. And... Opportunities are open to us. Even my grandparents never went anywhere in an aeroplane. My maternal grandparents went abroad exactly once in their life when me and my mum took them. We used to be able to get 24-hour passports. We took them on a day trip to France on a boat. That was it. I have, I have been to every continent except Antarctica, nearly always for work. So the, the kind of the luck and the choice that I have is immeasurably more. But it's not just material change. I think it's also change in society, in the choices that we have about how we live. Uh, and I, I found this photo. This is from the 1980s. It's a, a march in Manchester against the thing called Clause 27 or Section 28, which was... Uh, you might recognise these younger versions of some famous actors. Uh, so this is within my lifetime. Uh, I, the government wanted to bring in a law. Well, they did, in fact, bring in a law saying that local authorities could not promote pretended family relationships, by which they meant gay relationships. Uh, they didn't want schools teaching that a gay relationship is as good as a heterosexual marriage. So this was the government actually saying, no, you can't, you can't say that. We, you know, it's legal now, it's legal now to be gay, although the age of consent wasn't equal at that stage, but you can't promote it, you can't say it's as good. We're not having it. Contrast that to today, where, and I think this is, this is one of the great success stories of the liberalisation of values, where two men in this country can get married and adopt children. So yeah, apart from overcoming the barriers of biology, socially, we, we very much accept that it should not make any difference what your sexual orientation is, 
you should be treated equally, you should be free to do that. So the kind of choices in how to live, where to live, what to study, what work to do that are available to us are extraordinary. And this, of course, brings me on to the third thing, which I think is really important in how things have changed, which is the importance of identity as the way we relate to the world. And I, I think this is genuinely new. So uh, do you recognize this guy? Yeah, anybody? Um, Sam Smith, yeah? You, you knew that, didn't you? You're going to sing one of his songs I, later. That, that's what the social trade is for. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I should look forward to that. So the reason, so you, you probably, if you recognize, he's a singer. Uh, sorry, they are a singer. Uh, and I'm just, I'm going to keep getting this wrong. Every time I talk about this, I, I stumble over this. This is the whole reason I am showing you a picture of Sam Smith is because Sam Smith on, I think it's Instagram, uh, made an announcement last year that they wanted to be called they, them. That, uh, and this is a rather, rather sweet little message. It's all kind of coming out. Oh, it's, uh, today's a good day, so here goes. Uh, I've decided to embrace myself for who I am inside and out. Uh, I have blanked out the, um, the, the bad word because uh, I didn't, didn't know how sensitive you were. I understand there will be many mistakes and misgendering, but all I ask is you please, please try. I hope you can see me like I see myself now. Thank you. And just after this, uh, one of the newspapers, I forget which one, it had a rather snidey headline that was something like, uh, just after asking to be called by pronouns, they then multimillionaire singer Sam Smith buys a two billion pound mansion in Hampstead. With this kind of subtext of, does it really matter what pronouns people use on you when you're an incredibly popular multimillionaire singer who can just buy a house like that? But I felt that was kind of missing the point because the point is that these things are so important today that somebody like Sam Smith would really care more about what pronouns strangers use about them than about you know, having the money to buy a house. Uh, and it, you know, I say this, it, I personally, I, I am presumably from the older generation because I genuinely don't feel these things very strongly. You know, when, when, when Twitter or, or even people at passport control call me sir, I, I, I don't mind at all. It, it just amuses me. I don't, I, don't, I don't identify as a woman. I just am a woman. But I, I, I think that puts me very firmly, really, in the last century in terms of, of, of the way people see things now. I, I think the, the, the fact that multimillionaire singer actually really cares that much about pronouns is a sign of where we're going. Uh, another example was last year's, last year's Pride Month was sponsored by Budweiser, who brought out uh, reusable beer cups in a, a range of rainbows, because the rainbow is the traditional symbol of gay liberation, uh, but now there's a rainbow of different rainbows. Uh, let's see if I can remember any of them. There's the, the black, gray, and white one is black for asexual, gray for gray asexual, where you only feel sexual desire sometimes. Now, I was talking about this at a sixth form recently, and there was a ripple of genuine disbelief in the room that anyone could only feel sexual desire sometimes. And I had to break the bad news to them that by the time they got to our age, you'd, you'd think that was quite good going. It all gets a bit more tiring. Um, uh, I don't know what white is like, sex all the time. I don't know. Uh, and then you've got, but then of course you've got gender identities. So it's like pink if you feel female, blue if you feel male, yellow if you feel like you don't really fit into either category. And so there's this whole, there's like a proliferation of categories that you can put yourself into. Now I have to say, I feel ambivalent about this because Whereas I think it's wonderful that we do have this much more freedom to live the way you want to live and be the person you want to be and love who you want to love, I also slightly feel that we're reaching the point where you have to put yourself into a category, that you can't just be the person that you are and live the life you want to live. You have to, you have to claim one of these boxes for your own. And if there isn't a box that suits you, you have to demand a new box and fit yourself into that. So, so I do actually feel ambivalent about this the way that identity has become a box that you can define yourself into. But I, I think this is absolutely the way the world is going, that somebody's identity is, uh, is very, very important to them and sometimes more important than material things. So these are the three things that, that brought us here. So my next question really was, well, 
Okay, so th this is what makes it possible, and th th these are the trends that are culminating in this personalization. But what is it that appeals to us about it? Because even though, to some extent, we will go, oh, I don't know if I like somebody gathering this data and knowing this about me, we also like the fact that things are personalized for us. We, we like the fact we're not getting the same as anybody else. And I think it's very interesting, Experian, who are a data broking company, they used to, used to be a credit reference agency, now they openly say, we collect and compile data on you, so we will know a lot of things about you by putting different data sets together. And they advertise this as a plus. They go, this is great, we know all this stuff about you, so we can deliver to you only stuff that's of interest to you. In this case, to a particular golf in a particular place at a particular time. This is literally just a, just a poster I saw at a station. I'm like, well, they're, they're not being bashful about this. And, uh, and then I thought, well, yeah, but hang on. Every time I see one of these interactive quizzes, I have to do it. Is, does anybody else do them? Is it just me? OK, it's just me. Well, anyway, I am apparently I'm Ursula from The Little Mermaid, which sounds kind of cool. Uh, and then I thought, well, okay, is this, is this just terrible? Are we all just a bunch of terrible narcissists? Now, I know you're all in uh, education, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the myth of Narcissus. Mm -hmm. You're all classically educated. We're just going to go through it in the original ancient Greek for the next 10 minutes. No, we're not. Okay, so if anybody's not familiar with this, the myth is that Narcissus, the beautiful youth, uh, who is loved by Echo, the lovely nymph, uh, is off in the woods and sees, the, sees this another beautiful youth and falls in love with him. Now, of course, it's very obvious from the painting, even if you didn't know the story, that he's seeing his own reflection. And so he falls in love with his own reflection. Poor old Echo just stands around calling vainly until she fades away, and there's only a voice that answers you in the woods, hence the name Echo. And, uh, and he looks at himself in love until he falls in and drowns, trying to get a kiss off this beautiful youth. Uh, and, and so this, this, this gives us narcissism. I'm really, I, I'm partly only showing you this painting as an excuse to show you the next picture, which is a found photo. Genuinely, I did not stage manage this photo. I was on a train. Somebody had had a shopping accident, and I saw some salad products reenacting the myth of Echo and Narcissus. I might actually make this a whole genre and start buying them and, and staging it myself, because this is so perfect. <laughs> it's uncanny, isn't it? There's Echo round the corner going, oh. Narcissus, Narcissus, and there he is gazing at himself in his own reflection. <laughs> but it, it, it's, I mean, it's the thing that's often thrown up, that we are just all narcissists today, and that's why we like everything for us. But in some ways, I think that's not true, because we're not more selfish. Young people volunteer for good causes as much as ever, if not more so. Uh, we, are, we are altruistic. I think it's just it's a different way of understanding who we are in the world. So now I'm going to move on and ask, what does this mean for learning? What is this, this, this sense that everything should be personalized for us? How does this sit with the idea of learning and knowledge? So I'm going to go back to some, uh, some really basic questions. Uh, so some questions for you. Where is Toronto? Canada. OK, questions will get harder. Uh, how old is Harvard University? 140, no older than that. 300, yes. It's older than the United States of America. Yeah, cool, huh? Uh, and what's the French word for werewolf? Lugaru, exactly. I thought there was a French speaker in. Uh, that was, that's a thing that I, I, I... Are you a native French speaker? Who was it that said? Ah, hit and run answers. Okay. <laughs> well, I was just curious, because I'm not a native French speaker, as was obvious by the way I pronounce it, and yet I was once asked... It, it, the context is too long to go into. I was asked in a bar, what's the French word for werewolf? And it popped to the top of my mind, loup-garou, just like that. And then I went, how did I know that? Where did that come from? It just like it'd been planted away somewhere. Uh, and neither of us knew. But here's a different type of question. All those questions, you could have just looked them up on the internet. It's really easy. To, some of you probably have. <laughs> some of you probably already done that. But here's another kind of question. Okay, this is a Fermi question. A uh, Fermi question is a question where you can't actually find the empirical answer, so you have to use informed estimation to get an answer. And the context of this question, how many cats are there in the world, is I was uh, emceeing an event called Maths Inspiration, which is absolutely brilliant days there for like fifth and sixth year, or what, years, years 11, 12, 13 math students, doing all the bits of maths that you don't actually get to do in the curriculum. They're really wonderful. They're run by this guy called Rob Easterway, and he was doing a talk on estimation. 
talked about Fermi questions and said to the kids, why don't you, for the Q&A session at the end, if you have a Fermi question, write it down and we'll work through it. So somebody put this in the box, how many cats are there in the world? And Rob is starting to estimate, go, well, you know, we need to know how many people are there in the world, how roughly how many cats per person. He's starting to work through this. And a boy in the second row puts his hand up and I say, oh yeah, have you got a question? And he said, no, no, I haven't got a question. I've got the answer, 600 million. And he, he just Googled it, obviously. <laughs> Slightly missing the point of the whole <laughs> Fermi question estimation process thing. Uh, but it, it made me think, oh, right, so it's, it really is true. All human knowledge is only three clicks away in the era of the internet. Uh, but where does that figure come from? Not the 600 million, because that, that like so many figures on the internet, is, is meaningless. I looked it up. I tried to find the origin of it. Somebody who worked for a cat charity plucked it out of the air, basically, as is so often the, the root of these suspiciously round figures. Uh, but the three clicks away, all knowledge being three clicks away in the age of the internet, that, I did find out where that came from. It came from a study at Stanford University where they got machines and people to try and get from one fact to another fact in a minimum number of clicks. Now, apparently, not everybody loves graphs as much as I do. I don't know why that's the case. So uh, if you're not familiar with this kind of graph, it's on a logarithmic scale, which means basically the numbers get closer together the further to the right you get. So 10 to the 1 in the middle, that is 10. Uh, 10 to the 0 is 1. But then at the other end, you've got 10 to 2, which is, which is 100. So some of the humans were taking 80, 90 clicks to get from one fact to another. Uh, and the, the scale on the, the vertical scale is how many searches took that number of clicks. So, so when you know those, it's, it's clear that 3 is the commonest for the black line, which is the machine line that the computers manage, so they're the mathematically optimum line. Uh, and 3, 4 is the is the kind of peak of the humans line it's a bit clearer if you look at the table of results where you can see that is it true that all knowledge is three clicks away in the age of the internet the answer is yes if you're a machine that can work out the shortest possible path if you're a human it's between four and 4.9 clicks away but but still not bad but this is this only works for certain kinds of knowledge. This only works for things like how old is Harvard University, what is Toronto, the, the, the factual things that have a definite checkable factual content. Uh, and it's this kind of fact that IBM Watson, the AI invented by IBM, named after one of their founders, used to win an American game show called Jeopardy. So, so this is Watson in the middle, obviously, like all these things, had a big, much bigger machine in the back room doing the crunching. And what they did, they wanted, they wanted an AI that could understand natural language, so the language that we use, that could be let loose on the internet to learn things directly off the internet without having to have somebody put it in in a form that computers like. And so they programmed Watson. They let Watson loose on the internet to hoover up all the facts and information that are out there, uh, and then they, they did disconnect Watson from the internet before the quiz, because that wouldn't be fair otherwise. But it's still quite impressive, because the form that Jeopardy takes, as well as a game show, is quite tricky verbally, because they give the question the form of an answer, and then you have to give the answer in the form of a question. So which is why they have who is Bram Stoker or, or who, is, who is Stoker as the answer. The question would have been something like, uh, I, I'm an Irish author that wrote Dracula, or, or whatever. Uh, so Watson managed not only the kind of slightly tortuous verbal form of the questions, but also to come up with the answers. And then also you have to bet on how confident you are about the answer. You're, you're essentially kind of giving a, a weight or a value to how confident you are that you're right, uh, which is the other part of it. And, and Watson beat these two human champions. You, I think you can see that one of them under his answer is written, I for one welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> keeping in with the winning side. However, Watson did mess up one answer in a slightly embarrassing way because they give you categories. They give you a category and then you know the answer is within this category. Uh, and the category was United States cities. And the answer Watson get, gave was, what is Toronto? <laughs> Awkward. 
Canadians especially are very sensitive about that kind of thing. And this, but you all knew, right? You all knew Toronto is Canadian. So why didn't Watson, this super brain computer that had gone out onto the internet, know this basic fact? Because it doesn't have context. It doesn't have human context and real world context. Uh, and I think this is, this is something really worth bearing in mind when we think about what is knowledge, what is learning, what is information, and what role does the, the computers play in this, is that they don't understand meaning. Now, I met a, a great guy called Stephen Skeena, a professor of computer science, really, really clever, really thoughtful. Uh, and he was researching the meanings of words and how they've changed over time using data. And I was skeptic about this. I said, well, you know, what do you, how, how can a computer know what a word means? He said, well, what we do is we feed in lots of text that humans have written, and the computer models the meaning of words uh, by putting them close to each other. So words that mean similar things go close to each other. Now, I, I, have, I have a problem with this because I, I sometimes get, I don't know if you get this, do you get into arguments on the internet ever? Social media? Yeah, okay, I, I, I'm going to take that as a yes. I get into, all right, discussions. Let's say discussions. I get into discussions on social media, and then sometimes people will use a word, and I'll go, okay, well, what do you, what, what do you mean by this word? Uh, because I want to know what, what they mean. And they answer rather rudely, L-M-G-T-F-Y. Do, do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? Let me Google that for you. <laughs> there is a ruder version, which is J F G I. Uh, and I won't spell that one out for you, but it basically means the, the same thing in a slightly ruder way. And, and I find this really annoying because I think, well, I, I don't want to know what Google thinks the word means. I want to know what you, what you mean right now in the context of this conversation we're having. Uh, so, so I was curious when Stephen Skeener said, you know, I've got an AI mapping how the meaning of words changes. I'm like, well, how can you possibly do that? He said, well, what we do is essentially we have a, a, a 200-dimensional mathematical space, again, I'm going to spare you and only show you three, and words that have similar meanings, the computer puts them close together, which is, which is kind of intuitive because, you know, we say, oh, happy and merry are close to each other in meaning. So we have that kind of intuitive thing. And it will physically map a, a mathematical location. So words with similar meanings, data, knowledge, and information will be clumped together. A uh, word like Toronto, its proper name, will be somewhere else. And then I guess you might put a word close to its its meaning in another language. So he's mapping these things out in 200 dimensional space. Which is, you know, I can see that you could do stuff with that and it might be useful for certain things, but at the same time, I, I think context is so important here. We take the word reason, it means so many different things in different contexts. If you talk about the age of reason, I doubt you could even get two historians agreeing on exactly when it begins and ends, let alone what it has meant for the development of human knowledge and learning. You could talk about without good reason, which to a lawyer might be the difference between you going to jail and not going to jail, but to a philosopher might be something more about free will uh, or the subconscious drives. Uh, or, of course, the, the, the Pascal quote, the heart has its reasons which reason knows not which is literally using the same word to mean two different things in the same sentence. He's literally saying you can use reason in the sense of a, a, something that causes you to do something, a, a, a causal root, a motivational force, the reasons of the heart. Uh, and then also over here you have reason as in the sense of logic and, uh, and, and a much more cerebral idea that... You, something that you go through different stages and you weigh up arguments and abstract thoughts and come to a conclusion. And he's, he's literally saying that those two things may be in opposition, they may be completely different within one person, within one sentence. So this, this is why when we talk about machines knowing the meanings of things, uh, I'm very sceptical. And it also brings me on to another thought, it actually, which is that if you look at this in French... I know we have at least one French speaker in the room, so apologies again for my accent. Le cœur a ses raisons que la raison ne connaît point, which knows not. But if you are a French speaker, you will be aware that this is one of two words in French for knowing. And that if you said in French, 
uh, if I said, do you know where Toronto is? And you said in French, oui, je le sais, I know it. You would be using a different word. So savoir is to know facts and information or maybe how to, how to read a graph. So that's that kind of knowledge. Uh, but connaître is a different kind of knowledge, is to be familiar with somebody, it's to know a person. And, and this, I think, brings us on to another really, really deep question, which is that if we talk about machines and algorithms and data knowing us, all they can ever know is know things about us. They can know, you know the same way that Twitter doesn't actually know me, it knows what I do on Twitter. Or, or even Experian can collect loads of data on where I live and what devices I own and when I take time off work to celebrate religious festivals and actually can infer quite a lot of intrusive personal information. But it doesn't actually know me the way that someone of you, any one of you sitting down with me for five minutes would know me person to person. And this is, I think, a great challenge. Trying to use uh, technology to personalize something like, well, but what is the person that you're personalizing it to? Are we just talking about some total of data? Uh, and I wanted to uh, uh, introduce you to, uh, d who, who uses Instagram? You can always see all the cool kids use Instagram. Okay, so you may have come across Lil Michaela. Anybody know it? Okay, good. Well, this is Lil Michaela, Instagram star, a million or so, probably a couple of million followers. I uh, used to get a lot of stick for looking a bit too perfect, a bit, bit airbrushed. Uh, used to get quite upset, as teenagers do, at, at being criticized for not being real. Then there was a bit of a drama where the, the Instagram account apparently got hacked and then came back and Lil Michaela said, uh, well, you know, it's been the hardest week of my life and I've got to say this, my hands are literally shaking. I'm not a human being. And Lil Michaela had gone through this very upsetting process of the of Brud, the agency that was that she was working with, going, okay, yeah, no, you're right, you're not, you're not actually real. You did they, all your fans were right. You are in fact created by us. And uh, I went through a couple of days of real soul searching. I have to say, at this point, all the fans rallied round and were extremely sympathetic, uh, and then said, oh no, it's terrible, they deceived you. They were really sympathetic to you, uh, and then. And they went on, there's this real kind of soul searching by Lil Michaela going, I am trying to realize my truth. I'm trying to learn my fiction. I want to feel confident in who I am. And to do that, I need to figure out what parts of myself I should and can hold on to. I'm not sure I can comfortably identify as a woman of color. Brown was a choice made by a corporation. Woman was an option on a computer screen. My identity was a choice, Brud, that's the agency, made in order to sell me to brands to appear woke. I will never forgive them. I don't know if I will ever forgive myself. Now, at this point, do the millions of followers go, ah, the whole thing was a trick. It was just this agency fooling us and leave. Not a bit of it. The fans, if anything, identify with her more. Send these really sympathetic messages going, this must be awful for you, what you're going through. Uh, and I'm really if anything, identify more with her. Now she said, I've just discovered I'm not real and I've been created by an agency, which I think is really, really interesting. By the way, spoiler, it's, it's all fine. She is still working with them and she's now got a lovely boyfriend. Uh, so it's all fine. Uh, you can buy her stuff online. But I think this is really, really interesting because for me, I'm going, you're, you're talking to her and, but you know that all her stuff is being written by this agency that you're denouncing for having deceived her, but like, do you not see what's going on here? And I realize, again, I'm, I'm starting to look at this the wrong way because if you live a lot of your life online through social media and you're constantly creating your identity online, then of course you would identify with her because you know, how really are you if you're, if you're creating your own identity in the world and curating what goes online? You know, what, what part of you is real and what part is fake? So I realized that they, they brilliantly hit on how we all, to some extent, feel that we, our identity is both out there and a real part of who we are and how we feel about ourselves. So, you know, Stephen in this picture is like, he's no more or less real than the rest of us. He, we're all in this world where we feel like we're the center of everything. 
and everything's being made for us, but we're not sure how real we are. And also, even more importantly, we feel like everything is being filtered for us, but actually, the reality is it's us who's being filtered. It's not that this company selflessly went, oh, Tamanda hates shopping, we must send her. Well, obviously, we think that she's a man, which is complicating, but you know, this, is, this is what this, this fictitious person needs from us. They went, we need to sell clothes to people who apparently hate shopping. Give us the 50% of people who appear to hate shopping the most, uh, and we'll, we'll target them. It's us who's being filtered and sorted. It's not that things are being filtered for us. We are being filtered. Uh, and I want to show you this. This is a picture of my deceased co-star and pet, Socrates. I was expecting a bit more sympathy in that, to be honest. I know not everybody likes rats, but he was very sweet. My deceased co-star, Socrates. Aww. Yeah, it was right. If you're going to do it sarcastically, don't bother. <laughs> but the thing is, I got, him, I got him to be in a show, and, and his job in the show was to demonstrate that rats are not like people, which he did admirably. Uh, he, was, he was sweet and an idiot. Uh, this is a feather boa that a friend's mother knitted for him. That, see, that really was personal. That was totally personal. It was one woman knitting him a feather boa, not like this, this thread stuff. But it made me think that a lot of the time, the kind of the way things are targeted and personalized to us actually treat us like lab rats. Uh, and this is, this is a slightly less sympathetic picture of a rat in a Skinner box, which is the kind of box they use to test what do you have to offer a rat to make it press a lever on demand to get a food reward. Uh, and this is, this is the really cynical model of things like social media rewards that they, they give to us whatever it takes to get us to keep pressing the button like a rat in a box. Now, I don't know about you, I don't really feel like a, a rat in a box. Uh, but, it, but it does raise this question of if, if learning is automated, are we in danger of treating learners like rats in boxes pressing levers rather than actually going, what we want, what we want is a world in which Harvard which was founded in 1636, in case anyone was wondering, the kind of learning that you could have got by going to Harvard in person and reading the books in the library and talking to the people and being present at lectures with amazing minds is now available to people through the wonders of technology. How can we get to that world rather than treating people as, as rats in boxes? So I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is this from Hannah Arendt. I know it's a, it's a bit early in the morning for German philosophers, but... She makes this really useful distinction, I think, between who and what. She goes, well, who somebody is, or was, we can only know by knowing the story of which he is himself the hero. Or herself. She, she didn't get tied up in those, uh, in those things. Uh, his biography, in other words. So it's, it's who we are is our life, is our life story. Everything else we know of him, including the work he may have produced or left behind, tells us only what he is or was. And, it, and it's this who, what question that I think we, we really have to address. This is uh, one of the archaeological sites in London where they found loads of skeletons while they were, they were building a new building. And they, they went through, and by studying them, they were able to learn an immense amount about those people. And I, I kind of get intrigued by this, partly because it shows you again how much better our lives are than, than the lives of people in the past. But it also, it, it, it reminds me of a similar thing because you could find a skeleton and say, oh, this person had chronic toothache for 50 years of their life. This person survived an attack with a sword but would have been scarred of the face and hand for the rest of his life. Uh, this person lost his nose either in a duel or to some kind of wasting disease. But, but you could know those things about those people. And it, it, it's quite amazing you get a biographical insight from just looking at their bones long after they're dead. But that wouldn't tell you that those people were Queen Elizabeth I of England, President Andrew Jackson of the United States of America, or the astronomer Tycho Brahe. It, so what's really important and interesting about those people, you don't tell from their bones. And, and this is the way I think about data, that you can tell a lot about somebody from their data, but you can't actually tell who that person was any more than if you look at my bones in 100 years' time. You'll know who I was. You'll know what I was. You'll know some stuff about me. But who I was, you can really only get by relating to me as a human being. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, we've only got a couple of minutes left. And I bet there's, there's lots of questions, like, why are you showing us a picture of bones? Uh, we are good. We've got a final wrap-up slide. Just the, just the title. There you go. So, uh, so yes, I, I, I'm genuinely interested to hear 
criticisms, thoughts, questions, whatever you've got, and I promise to steal your thoughts and put them in my next book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs>